Okay, thank you, Lee. Welcome everyone to the League of Women Voters Upper Mississippi River Region final educational programming of our 23-24 year. You can learn more about us on our website, www.lwvumrr.org. We're glad to have you with us today. This is being recorded, so if you have friends that cannot be with us today, they can go to our website afterwards and view the program. Uh, just a quick reminder that this is the last educational programming of our calendar year, but our annual meeting is May 29th. And you can find more information about that on our website as well. We have a special speaker at that annual meeting. So if you wanna find out about that, check out the website. We're very excited about this last program of the year. We focus a lot on water quality and the impact that various industries have on our rivers and streams. Welcome Catherine Franzik, who is our board treasurer and she will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Mary Ellen. I'm honored to introduce tonight's presenter. Robert Hirschfield is the Director of Water Policy for the Prairie Rivers Network. Robert joined PNR in March of 2011 and leads efforts to ensure water quality, water quantity, water access, and water equality for all of Illinois. He advocates and speaks for clean water river protection, biological integrity, wildlife conservation, climate mitigation, and ad adaptation. Through collaboration with local, regional, state, and national partners, he pursues policies, programs, and strategies that will ensure the long-term health and beauty of Illinois communities, rivers, and habitat. Robert has a BA in Religion and Asian Studies from the University of Puget Sound and a JD from the University of Illinois College of Law. Welcome and thank you, Robert, for joining us tonight to educate us about the work of the River, Prairie Rivers Network and the Clean Water Forever campaign. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and I will uh, have a little bit of a slideshow tonight. Um, I'll plow ahead and if it's not working, please chime in and let me know. Um, okay, can you all see that? Great. Yes. So again, I, I want to thank you for inviting me here um, as someone who spends my days working on public policy and trying to change law policy, hearts and minds uh, to make the world a little better for everyone who calls this place home. It's it's gratifying to have all of you here and care about the issues and, and, and participating in the process. It, it really is extremely important. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, yeah, I'm the director of water policy at Prairie Rivers Network. Uh, we are a clean water advocacy organization based in Illinois. Our mission is to protect water, heal land, and inspire change. Um, and so we, we do a lot of work on water quality around the state of Illinois. Uh, we got our start actually in the 60s, um, stopping a Army Corps of Engineers dam project that would have flooded out uh, the beautiful Allerton Park in central Illinois. And I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but it is a really special, precious place. Um, the Sangamon River runs through there. And um, you see the mansion here, which was built by, uh, this, by Robert Allerton. And he went around the world and collected art and statues. And it's just an incredible place. But not only is the mansion there, but there's a huge area of park and woods and upland forest and bottomland forest and it's a really really special place and this was back in the days still kind of post new deal where the army corps of engineers was just running around the country building dams everywhere uh despite um the environmental harm that they were often doing and our founders got together and worked with farmers and locals and stopped the dam and really um ended the era of dam building. So um, that was 55 years ago, give or take, um, and we are still going strong. Um, here's our current staff. Uh, we got together for a little staff retreat 
a month or two ago back at, at Allerton. This is one of the gardens. So that's, that's our staff currently. Um, we, um, yeah, we've got people all across the state of Illinois and we've really been growing uh, recently. And so it's, it's a very exciting time for us. I feel like we, we're really hitting our stride right now. I got my start actually, let's see, 13 years ago. My first project was working on invasive carp and the Chicago area waterway system. And even though I'm not going to focus my talk today on this, I do like to bring it up because I think it's an amazing bit of history. Um, and it was a really uh, great place to start my working environmental education because uh, it was very illuminating about why things are the way they are, who are the powerful players, who calls the shots. Um, and so for those of you who don't know, once upon a time, as you can see on the left side of the screen, the Chicago River and the Calumet River flowed into Lake Michigan. And as Chicago was booming in the 1800s, uh, the hog butcher, hog butchering capital of the world, bringing all this commerce, all these commodities in from the, the expansion out west and sending them, it was the hub for sending them back to the east coast. Chicago's population was growing and Chicago was just putting its raw sewage and waste right into the river and it was going out into Lake Michigan, which was its drinking water source. That is obviously a recipe for illness <laughs> and disaster. And sure enough, there were problems with cholera outbreaks and it was just a really bad situation. Mm -hmm. And so right around 1900, Chicago uh, engaged in this massive engineering mm -hmm. project um, and they reversed the flow of the river and built these canals to connect Lake Michigan to the Des Plaines River, which you can see there to the west. So over the watershed divide, they reversed the flow of the river, which connected the Chicago River to the Des Plaines River, which connects to the Illinois River, which connects to the Mississippi River, which goes all the way to the Gulf. And, um, you know, this was all done to make everyone downstream <laughs> be the sacrifice zone for Chicago's waste, right? Uh, so that's the paradigm that, that began in 1900. And, and I think it's an important thing. And I, I, I call it out because I think it's, it is a through line and it's something that we live with today. And it's kind of a theme of what I want to talk about is, is forcing communities to be sacrifice zones, forcing downstream communities to pay the cost of someone else. All right. So in, in economic parlance that this is an externality. Um, so I got involved because not only did this pathway open up, uh, you know, allow Chicago to send its pollution downstream to Peoria, to St. Louis, eventually to the Gulf of Mexico. It also opened, opened up a pathway for invasive species. And um, I don't, you know, maybe some of you are familiar with these invasive carp that are in the Mississippi River, but a lot of the Great Lakes states were worried about um, what would happen if these invasive carp get in the lakes. And so I, I came on and, and kind of started looking at like, how does this system work? How could it be re-engineered? And uh, it quickly became apparent to me that despite the fact that these are public waters and the public pays about 95% of the cost, the American taxpayer pays about 95% 95 of the cost to operate these waterways. The people who call the shots are the shipping industry, the barge industry, and the people kind of behind, the industries behind them that move their products. And that's largely ag and petrochemicals. And we have radically transformed our rivers channelized them, straightened them, turned them into open sewers and, and, and shipping canals, and largely for the benefit of these industries. And there are massive, massive costs to this. And it is all part of that idea of send it away, make it someone else's problem, turn this other area, turn these other communities into sacrifice zones. So I might come back to this a little later if we have time, but that's my background. Um, I think it's a fascinating bit of history and it's an illuminating one because it really does tell us about how we have, what we've done to our rivers, how we've treated them. Here you can see uh, just a photo from um, right around the turn of the last century uh, when they were building the canal to connect the Chicago River to the Des Plaines River. And here's what the Illinois River is like today. Uh, this is probably actually probably fairly flooded out, but you can see one of these large barges using the river to move product. Um, Robert, like said, yes, 
If I may, for a second, I'd like to remind the participants that they can put their questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Thank you. Okay, so um, today we uh, continue our work on water quality. Um, I work a lot on agricultural pollution. I'm going to be talking, spending a lot of my time tonight talking about that. Um, but we also have a lot of legacy fossil fuel pollution in Illinois. And so we have a very strong program at Prairie Rivers Network dealing with that, cleaning up coal ash waste that's been left behind. Um, it's often left uh, near our rivers uh, because of where coal plants have historically been situated. And we've worked a lot the last couple of years um, on uh, to pass historic climate legislation. So getting Illinois on a pathway to being 100% uh, renewable and where we're we are working with communities across the state particularly ex former coal communities to ensure that they are part of this transition to a new energy economy and that they're not left behind um, because that's that's very important just the way sh illinois is is set up with so much of the political economic power being in the chicago metro region it really is a, a serious divide between chicago and the rest of the state and so um we're trying to make sure that that these communities that um, depended on coal, coal mining, coal burning, um, are part of this new energy economy. So I work mostly on the water side, and um, you know I think one problem that we face is people don't know how serious the problem is when it comes to water pollution. Um, you know, I think we're a little bit divorced from what's happening on the landscape. Uh, most people living in cities just expect it, you know, you turn on the tap and you expect your water to be clean coming out of the tap or at least relatively clean. And, um, you know, uh, we really do have a serious, serious issue in Illinois. And as we at Prairie Rivers Network sat around and tried to think about like, what, what can we do? How can we really put a spotlight on these issues? How can we um, get, build the power to advocate for the change that we need? And, um, you know, I think we have a lot of awareness raising to do. And some of the numbers that I, I often call out because I think they highlight how significant and serious the problem is. So here we are. Of the stream miles in Illinois assessed by Illinois EPA, and they have to do this assessment every couple of years under the Clean Water Act, of the mile, stream miles that they assessed, 40% were too polluted to support aquatic life. 61% too polluted to support indigenous aquatic life. 85% of streams are too polluted to support swimming or human, direct human contact. And 100% Yes, a full 100% are too polluted to support fish consumption. You know, this is shocking, right? This is really, these are really awful numbers. This indicates how dire the situation is. And so out of this, we are launching, we have launched our Clean Water Forever program, uh, our a campaign. And this campaign is is an attempt to put all of these issues under the umbrella, whether it's energy, climate, wildlife habitat, agricultural pollution, legacy pollution, um, habitat destruction, wetland loss. Our background, our, our touchstone has always been water. And so this is our campaign, clean water forever. We want something that we can rally behind. We want something that people can get behind, we, that we can go into communities and build the power that we need to change law and policy. And our ask is basically right there in the campaign name. We want clean water and we want clean water forever, right? We shouldn't, we should be thinking longer than five years, 50 years. How long do we plan to be here? I think we should plan to be here as long as possible. So let's think big, let's think, lo let's think long term. So we launched this campaign in uh, no, last November. And as part of that, we invited Chris Jones from Iowa over to our neighboring state of Illinois to talk. And um, Chris is, uh, had been a research engineer at University of Iowa and has kind of made a name for himself in the last couple of years 
being an outspoken critic of agriculture. And he had worked at the Soybean uh, Association in Iowa. He'd worked at Des Moines, uh, Des Moines Waterworks. Um, and then he had, you know, he and a couple other academics, University of Iowa, had really started talking about the serious problem in Iowa's waters due to agricultural pollution. And um, started making some noise and powerful people heard that noise. And in fact, uh, members of the Iowa legislature went to the University of Iowa and told the University of Iowa, hey, we give you a lot of money. The legislature funds you. And we don't particularly like what this guy is saying about our state's biggest industry. And, uh, you know, <laughs> your funding, you, your university funding is potentially at risk. And so there was really an effort to uh, silence Chris. And he used that opportunity to say, you know what, I'm done. And he walked away from his job and he published a book and he's been on a speaking tour ever since. And he's a really powerful voice talking right in the heart of the agricultural industry about the problems it is causing in our waters. And so we kicked this off uh, last November you know, because we're trying to get loud about the problems. So a lot of this stems from how radically we have transformed the landscape. Um, so here on the left side, we see early 1800s Illinois and the two primary landscapes that you see are the prairie grassland in the kind of tan color and um, the forest in green, right? And you can see in the few areas, the pink where there's some developed area. So that's that's early 1800s. Uh, we had a lot of wetlands. We had lots of prairie. Mm. So that image on the right side is how is what is what Illinois is like today in terms of land cover. So that yellow is agriculture. The green is still forest. And you can see where the pink is developed areas, particularly in the Chicago metro region. If you if I took a single if I took a pencil dot, or a little sharpie and made just a one little dot on that map that would represent all the prairie that we have left all the original prairie one little dot and it's scattered around the state so we've lost over 99 percent of our historical prairie we have lost over 95 percent of our wetlands um there is, there are 36 million acres in illinois and about 27 million of the acre of those acres are in farmland and about 23 million of that, those acres of, of farms are row crop farming, you know, mainly corn and soybeans. So that gives you a sense of how we have transformed the state. And when you transform a landscape like that, there are impacts. Um, there have been benefits, but there have been significant costs. One of those costs is that um, we are sending so much pollution downstream throughout the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico. This map represents the green you see run off from agricultural lands and the pink again represents urban areas. And so these, this is the, the whole Mississippi River watershed and the green is sources of agricultural pollution. The pink is sources of urban pollution. All of that is going into the Mississippi River and it's going downstream and it's going into the Gulf and creating a dead zone. So largely we're talking about nitrogen and phosphorus here. And so every year there's a massive area in the Gulf of Mexico uh, where because of all this nitrogen and phosphorus pollution, um, all the ox oxygen gets, you creates an anoxic zone where there's no oxygen in the water and therefore nothing can live. So back to where I started, right? I talked about Chicago um, sending its waste downstream, making people downstream suffer the consequences of that, turning this whole area into a sacrifice zone. So Chicago's historically in, in the Great Lakes watershed, but it sends its waste downstream as does 23 million acres of farmland in Illinois alone, plus the millions of acres you see throughout the rest of the Mississippi River Basin. So not only is this an ecological disaster in the Gulf, but there are people down there, shrimpers, commercial fisheries, 
who pay the economic price for what happens. <laughs> the Gulf. Um, this was a story that was in the Chicago Tribune a couple months ago about uh, Illinois' contribution to the Gulf dead zone. But it's also not just about polluting the Gulf of Mexico a thousand miles away. All this agricultural pollution, all of this nitrogen is also a problem right here at home. So uh, nitrate is a byproduct of the nitrogen. Um, and nitrate contaminates drinking water for almost 60 million people in cities across the country. And nitrate is linked to a whole host of health concerns, uh, perhaps most famously what's called blue baby syndrome, which again, um, it's very problematic for infants. And, and again, it basically takes the oxygen out of their blood. But more recent studies have shown that nitrate is a problem or is, is, it, is linked, is correlated with all kinds of health concerns, particularly various cancers. Um, so the federal limit for nitrate in water is 10 milligrams per liter. But more recent studies have shown that there may be health concerns at much lower levels than 10 milligrams per liter. Here's some research that Prairie Rivers Network has done over the last couple of years. Um, the lightest colored dots are where we found nitrate concentrations less than one milligram per liter, which is that's probably a safe. The orange dots are between one and 10. So in that area where it's under the federal limit, but potentially still problematic. And those red dots are areas where we found nitrate contamination above 10. Some of these are very high, 40 milligrams per liter, up to 90 milligrams per liter. Illinois has some of the highest um, hot spots. And the, you know, this looks like we have a lot of data, but we actually don't. <laughs> we have very limited data sets because unfortunately we're not actually looking as much as we should be. So um, we pulled this from some well testing that's been done and from some non-community public water systems. So um, as best we could, we're trying to take a look at what's going on in Illinois and the situation does not look good. So everyone knows this is a problem. The federal government knows that this is a problem. The US EPA told states 10, 15 years ago, hey, you gotta deal with the Gulf of Mexico dead zone. And so each state has kind of developed its own strategy or program to try and reduce all of this nutrient pollution that's going into the Mississippi River and going down to the Gulf. And Illinois' strategy is called the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy. And I always have to stop there and just say, wait a minute, what does that say? What does that mean? <laughs> also, is that a double negative nutrient you know, loss reduction? But then I got to think, well, nutrients, are nutrients good or bad? I usually think of nutrients as being good, but here they're kind of bad. Is this a double negative or a triple negative? I can't, I think it is opaque to the point where no one can understand what this is even about. And a cynic might say it's purposefully opaque. It is not meant to paint a clear picture of the reality of what's happening on our landscape and in our water. So every two years, the state releases the results and it gives an assessment of how things are going. So Illinois' goal is to reduce the amount of nutrient pollution that we're putting in our waters by 45% as compared to what was in our water but from a baseline uh, uh, set in 1980 to 1996. And so from that baseline of how much nit uh, nitrogen and phosphorus was going underwater, the goal is to reduce it by 45%. So, <laughs> not only are we not reducing, not only are we not meeting our goal, are we not making enough progress in a timely manner, things are getting worse. We have increased the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus going into our waters. And we've increased them by quite a bit, 5% more. So not only have we not reduced it by 45%, we put in 5% more nitrogen. We put in 35% more phosphorus over the last few years. This is a screenshot from the latest biennial report. And I think it illustrates some of the problems in our state um, and how our state is approaching this. So right here in a big, big letters in the call, you know, right here on this call out box, 73,000 pounds of nitrogen and 30,000 pounds of phosphorus were kept out of waterways 
through agricultural conservation projects, cost shared by our government. 73,000 pounds. Maybe that's a lot. I don't know. Is that a lot? Who knows? I don't think the public knows whether 73,000 pounds of nitrogen is a lot. Well, let's take a look at the small, let's take a look at the figure um, that's actually going in. It's 416 million pounds. And that's per year. So 73,000 pounds were kept out over two years, where 416 million pounds are going in every year. And we are spending millions of dollars on something that is not working. So this strategy has handcuffed itself because all it will consider is what's called voluntary conservation. And voluntary conservation basically means that the public pays farmers to implement conservation practices on their land. So it's not regulated. Agricultural runoff on that map that I showed earlier, all that green area in the Mississippi River Basin, agricultural runoff is not regulated. Now point source pollution is regulated. Under the Clean Water Act, we've made tremendous strides from with reducing pollution that comes at the end of a pipe from a wastewater treatment facility or from uh, an industrial you know, coal plant. There are laws and regulations and rules about that pollution. That pollution has to be permitted, not so for agriculture. And so all of these state strategies to deal with agricultural pollution, they have taken actual regulation off the table. He said, we're only gonna think about voluntary measures, but it's not working. So the point source sector, like I talked about, okay, they have laws and rules and regulations. Well, guess what? They actually reduced the amount of pollution they're putting out by 34%. So there are interim goals as well. And the point source sector is meeting those interim goals. In fact, exceeding the interim goals. The point source sector is regulated. There are rules about its pollution. They're getting the job done. Ag, not so much. $51 million spent on ag-related activities during 21, 2021 and 2022. A lot of that is public money. A lot of that is taxpayer money. Not all of it, but a lot of it is. Government cost share programs kept out 73,000 pounds of nitrogen. 416 million pounds of nitrogen per year going into Illinois' waterways. What would actually be the cost to fully implement the nutrient loss reduction strategy? It's $900 million annually. That's in 2015 dollars, so it's probably well above a billion dollars a year now when you account for inflation. And, and yeah, so that's to achieve 45% reduction, $900 million a year. That's Illinois alone. I guarantee you the state doesn't have that kind of money. It's simply not realistic. It is simply not a serious strategy to ask public taxpayers to pay to reduce pollution that they didn't create. That's money that could be going to any, whatever else you want, $900 million a year. And what we keep hearing is like, ah, oh, we got to fund the nutrient loss reduction strategy. We got to fund the strategy. I haven't heard anyone call to actually fund it $900 million a year because it's, it's not a serious strategy. So the goal is only 218 million pounds of nitrogen a year. The current five year average of the Gulf dead zone is just over, is about, is over 4,000 square miles. The, the nutrient loss reduction strategy goal is a 1,900 square mile dead zone. That's still a huge area. 1,900 square miles, that's still a lot. To put that into perspective, the entire city of Chicago is 234 square miles. So right now we have 18 Chicago's worth of dead zone. And if we were to achieve our goal, which we're not even getting close to, we would only have eight Chicago's of dead zone. So I'm trying to put this problem into some perspective here. Here's a quote put out by our Illinois Department of Agriculture director, along with the report that came out last year. This biennial report showcases the commitment of the agriculture industry to be good stewards of the land, said Illinois Department of Agriculture director Jerry Costello. I'm sorry, Jerry, I have to disagree about that. I, I don't know what report you're reading. I don't know what numbers you're looking at. And this is a real problem where our state feels like they cannot just present the reality, present the facts and figures. They are running interference 
for this massively politically powerful industry, row crop agriculture. And it's not just water. It's not just water pollution. It's not just drinking water. It's not just the Gulf. Last year in Illinois, there was a tragic accident along Interstate 55 where it was an extremely windy day and all of this soil, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a dust storm. I call it a soil storm. All this soil came blowing off the fields next to the interstate and out of nowhere and created a situation where you could not see on the road. And it was a horrible tragedy and multiple people lost their lives, right? This is Dust Bowl stuff, right? This is 30s Dust Bowl stuff. And we know what to do and we're not doing it. So what can we do about it? What should we do about it? Whose responsibility is it? I think it's important to put into context how much the public subsidizes row crop agriculture. Here's just one element of the subsidy that we as taxpayers pay agriculture. Total indemnities and subsidies for crop insurance programs, 1995 to 2022. So we paid out $172 billion for losses. And we, and we paid, we subsidized premiums, $123 billion. Total net farm income and government payments. So this is as of 2019 right here, that's this last little dot, $22 billion in government payments. Whereas net farm income is well over a hundred billion, 22 billion in one year. The top 10 commodities receiving subsidies 2016, you can see corn is receiving well over 2 billion in subsidies. Soybeans is the next biggest re recipient of subsidies. And who's getting these subsidies in terms of the farmers? Well, there was a recent report from the government accountability mm -hmm. office that shows these subsidies are not helping diversified farmers. They are not helping small farmers. A lot of these subsidies are going to millionaire farmers and a huge percentage of them are going actually to the insurance companies that kind of run the, the programs. So we're paying a lot of money. The public is paying a lot of money. My position, simply put, is that the public for all the money that we are investing in agriculture should get a return on our investment. We should get a say in how things are done. And that return should be cleaner water. It shouldn't be 100% of our waters too polluted to eat the fish. 36 million acres of total land, 26 million of farmland, 23 million acres of row crops, 11 million acres of corn, 45% of U.S. corn now goes to ethanol. Now, I don't know if it's totally 45% in Illinois. Let's be conservative and say it's about 30% of corn in Illinois goes to ethanol. That is still 10, that is still about three and a half million acres. That's 10% of our total land going to ethanol, which is totally unnecessary. Recent studies show that the climate impact of ethanol may be worse than straight up gasoline. And it's subsidized. We've created an artificial market through the renewable fuel standard where we have to blend ethanol into gasoline. Why are we doing this? This is so unnecessary. It incentivizes corn to be grown in all kinds of areas where it wouldn't otherwise be grown. It keeps the price of land sky high, which I understand that's why landowners may like it. But that prevents newer farmers, younger farmers, farmers who want to try things differently. That really prevents them from getting into the game. Keeps land prices so high because we have propped them up through federal subsidies, federal programs that are not worth it. So, you know, some people say, well, okay, we're feeding the world, you know, agriculture, right? We're doing this, we're doing that. I would ask you, has this system, has this agricultural system that really developed post-World War II been good for rural America? I'd offer that it hasn't. The tax base, the tax base has dwindled. Healthcare has gone away. Schools have closed. 
Two questions. Who has called the shots in terms of policy in rural America? What industry has called the shots? And has that been good for rural America? Here's a photo of Rankin, Illinois. What to do about it? Well, we could diversify our farming system. We could have a lot more crops on the land than corn and soybeans. If I could do any one thing, I would scrap the renewable fuel standard, get rid of the ethanol mandate. Why are we doing this? We should not be interfering in the market in this way. We don't have to crop in the two-year floodplain. We don't have to do fall tillage. We don't have to apply manure and fertilizers in the fall. We could update and adhere to new fertilizer guidelines, which show that we do not need to be applying as, applying as much fertilizer as we are to farmland. So there's a lot of things that we could do here. The question is, do we spend millions and millions and millions of dollars asking farmers, please, nicely, implement these programs? And then maybe they do for a year or two, and then maybe they don't do it when the price of corn drops because it's too expensive. Or do we say, we are putting millions of dollars into this industry. We expect a return on that investment. I stole this quote from Chris Jones when he talked for us. I like it. Power concedes nothing without a demand, right? So I went to Director Costello's office last year and he said, look, here's the reality. We're not going to get this done. What's the low hanging fruit? You know, what, what can we do here? What's the lowest hanging fruit? What's the minimal thing we can do? And why should I expect him to do more than that? Because we have not built the power to demand more than that. The agriculture industry, the row crop industry in Illinois is so powerful, so powerful. They make the demands, they get what they want. When a bill comes up in the Illinois state legislature, almost 100% of our legislators ask, where is Farm Bureau on this? They don't ask, does this bill make our water cleaner? What does this bill do for, what does this law do for people downstream? Does this get us clean water forever? Now they ask, what, is our, what does Farm Bureau think? So that's what clean water forever is about. We have to build the power to demand change. And we are, <laughs> this is a big thing. We are up against a powerful industry and we are up against an industry with an incredible mythology and culture behind it. I have two kids, a five-year-old and a two-year-old, and we've got all these books about farming and farm animals. And it is deep. It is deeply embedded in American history and American culture. And it's funny, all of the farms that are in these books, they don't look anything like farms look like today. Some farm from the 1930s, diversified, multiple, you know, they're growing fruits and vegetables along with grains. There are animals, there's livestock grazing. It's a closed system farm. Nothing looks like that now. So we are up against a big challenge, not only in the political power and economic power that they wield, but the cultural mythology around farming. So that is what Clean Water Forever is about. We are trying to go into communities and build power around the thing that people can rally around, clean water. And we're trying to do this on issue by issue. And so I'm gonna to point to one right now that we're working on this year. The pillars of our Clean Water Forever campaign, uh, water quality, water quantity, access and equity. So here's a quality issue. Last year, the US Supreme Court removed Clean Water Act protections, federal Clean Water Act protections for millions of acres of wetlands across the country. They basically said, the federal Clean Water Act does not cover all of these wetlands. Uh, I put a quote in here from Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh because uh, I think it's illustrative. Kavanaugh is hardly a liberal, <laughs> and yet you read his, I don't want to get into the weeds of the, the Supreme Court case because in one hand it was 9-0 and people point to that, but, but the 9-0 thing doesn't matter. What matters is the court split basically 5-4 on why they ruled how they did. And Justice Kavanaugh was part of the four in the minority about what the rule should be. And he basically takes the majority to task for rewriting the law. So hardly a uh, environmental liberal, Justice Kavanaugh thought, you know, this is, this is not right. We, this, we should not be doing this. It ignores science, ignores the text of the law. 
So we are working with a coalition of organizations to pass state law in Illinois to protect uh, wetlands. Um, I have here a link to our action alert. You can also use the QR code um, if you're at home and you want to scan it with your phone. And so this would basically replace what was lost under the Sackett decision. Uh, and so wetlands in Illinois would be, would, you have to have a permit to fill them and it would be run by the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. The bill exempts farming. I'll say that again, the bill exempts farming, okay? That's what's necessary to get it passed. So we are just trying to set things back to the way they would have been last year, but the state would run the program instead of the federal government. Speaking of power, okay, here's what the Illinois Farm Bureau said about the bill that we proposed. Illinois Farm Bureau is deeply concerned about the future of farming in Illinois, blah, 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 should this bill pass. Are, is, I mean, seriously? Are you truly seriously concerned about the future of farming? What could you not do two years ago? I have been around, I live in central Illinois, I live in east central Illinois. Can't, farming is not illegal here. I look north, south, east, west, there's farmland as far as I can see. And again, this bill exempts farming. Are you even being honest about what's happening here? Uh, if you all would like to participate, I'm just going to throw this out there. We are running a photo blitz. So if you're, in, if you're on social media, share photos of wetlands uh, to show how beautiful they can be, uh, show their value. Use the hashtag Protect Illinois Waters if you're interested in participating. I just wanted to mention that. So we're trying to get this bill passed. It's extremely important. Wetlands filter out pollution. They could filter out some of that pollution that's running into our rivers. They act as giant sponges protecting communities from flooding. They provide critically important habitat for wildlife and birds. Here's another thing we're trying to do. Again, what, these are rallying points. So access. Our Illinois Department of Natural Resources has improperly restricted the public from accessing and using for recreational purposes the waters of Illinois. So again, we have another action alert here. Here's a quick snapshot. Here's all the streams in Illinois, streams and rivers. Here are the 2% of rivers that our Department of Natural Resources says are public. You know, that's nonsense, absolute nonsense. There are people using these water bodies right now that, you know, for kayaking and canoeing. Um, so many of these waterways are, you know, are and should be open. And so um, we totally disagree with what the DNR says the law is. And so we are trying to get another bill passed to affirm and protect the right of Illinois citizens to access their public waters. So we are also running another campaign that puts a spotlight on a different set of agricultural pollution. And this is called Save Our Trees. And so for the past six years, Prairie Rivers Network has been monitoring damage, injuries done to trees, natural areas, organic farms, gardens, done by drifting herbicide pollution. And we have seen damage all across our state. So, in recent years, we've started using, particularly in agriculture, some highly volatile pesticides. Drift where you spray these herbicides and pesticides and the wind carries it and carries the droplets onto neighboring land, that's long been a problem. But with some of these newer formulations, or actually some of them are older formulations that we've had to go back to because weeds have become resistant to the newer formulations, some of the formulations that are, we're using right now are highly volatile, meaning that they even after they've been applied especially in warm days and we're seeing a lot more warm days the chemicals vaporize turn into vapor go up into the atmosphere can travel long distances and then come down on other areas and so we've seen damage all across the state here's what some of that looks like these cupped curled leaves and once you begin to look for it you see it everywhere i have a five-year-old who goes to a nature school on the south edge of our town um, and right up against some farmland but it, it's a beautiful school they spend 90 percent of the day outside digging in the dirt you know looking looking at bugs playing outside 
unless the weather is really cold or really hot. It's on a restored prairie. It's an amazing place. Multiple times every year, they have to run the kids inside because these chemicals are drifting over from the neighboring properties. And you might say like, well, Robert, you know, what do you expect? They're out there on the edge of farmland. That's what you get. And number one, you know what? I expect property rights to be, res to be respected. I expect the bodily autonomy of these kids to be respected. Just because you live next to a farm doesn't mean you should get hit with chemicals. But even if I said, okay, hard to control, it is what it is. They are out in the farm, they're out in farm country. Actually, I'm gonna look at that quote because I think it's important from the director of the school. It's frightening and frustrating and frankly, deeply unfair that our property rights and the bodily autonomy of these children are not respected. Anyway, so we tested all over town, not just on the edge of town. We tested 13 sites in town, on the edge of town. We tested at sites where we knew the property owners were not applying chemicals, local weed treatment, parks, schools. All 13 sites tested positive. 12 of the 13 tested positive for multiple herbicides. All of the sites showed visible damage, but we sent the tissue samples to a lab. Everything was damaged. You wouldn't know here, but the mayors are here, the parks department are here. So we set up a tour, we brought people around. We started, you know, we started making noise about this issue. We we're really pushing this. This is important. This is something that people can understand. I think the nutrient pollution can be difficult for people to understand. What is it? But when you think of these chemicals drifting onto you, you're breathing them, they're hitting your house, they're hitting your yard, they're hitting your garden. That's something people can understand. I'm gonna skip through some of these for the sake of time. I can't see my clock. Um, can you tell me how much time I have? You've got another five minutes. Okay, okay, perfect. So this spring, we are running our Save Our Trees campaign in Champaign-Urbana. Uh, we are about to release a report in the next couple of weeks that documents six years of monitoring uh, of herbicide injuries. We will be doing art activations in town. We're working with local artists. We're doing a, a benefit concert. We will be doing a uh, activation at Carl Park in Urbana, which is a historically significant park. And it's got these just, it's just incredible. I think someone told me it has every single native tree in Illinois is in the park, these beautiful old trees. And we will be tying ribbons around every tree in the park. We are trying to get people to see what's happening because when you destroy a river, when you transform the landscape, when all these trees are damaged, it starts to become what you're used to. Collective amnesia. We don't even know what we're looking at. And so we are trying to bring people's attention to what is happening. And so we are doing a lot of work on this Save Our Trees campaign. Um, I'm also hopeful that there will be some big media about this in, in the future. Um, this is happening across the Midwest and South. So corn, soybeans, cotton. If you're planting those crops, there's probably herbicide drift problems, um, particularly with dicamba and 2,4-D. Um, we're, we're, so we'll have bumper stickers and um, coasters and all kinds of things that we're developing for that. Here's the, uh, the poster for our benefit show that we're doing uh, later this month. So this is our, <laughs> this is our big push this, for the Save Our Trees. And I'm going to close here back kind of where I started. Um, this is Brandon Road Lock. It's in Joliet, Illinois. Um, this lock is the site of what's going to be a billion dollar project to hopefully stop carp from moving up the river system towards the Great Lakes. It's a billion dollar project that's going to take 10 years why did we put the project here this is a natural river we're gonna we're gonna put we're gonna electrify this river we're gonna put electric barriers in here we're gonna put bubble curtains sound barriers we're gonna fortify this lock we're gonna militarize it this is the Des Plaines River this is not the Chicago Canal you could close the lock for like six million dollars you could do it in a matter of weeks 
it would be basically foolproof to prevent carp coming upstream. But we've settled on a solution that will cost the taxpayers far more money, that's less effective, that will take longer. Because what this solution does not do is disrupt the status quo that I talked about at the beginning. Shippers own the waterways. Farmers own the floodplain. Our rivers should be communities of life in both time and space. Yet we've channelized them. We've turned them into open sewers and highways for barges. We've done similar things to our landscape as well. All these straightened drainage ditches to send the water pollution, to send the agricultural pollution away. This solution, quote unquote, does not disrupt the status quo. Chicago gets to continue to send its wastewater downstream. It could clean up its wastewater and put it back in, in Lake Michigan at this point. All the other cities around the Great Lakes do it. But Chicago gets to save some money because the standard for the river is lower. And so these sac this idea of the sacrifice zone, of the downstream, of a way, whether it's our river, whether it's the Gulf of Mexico, whether it's people who have to drink nitrate contaminated water out of their wells in, in rural areas. This is what I want to put the spotlight on. This for me is about clean water forever. When I say that one of the pillars is equity, justice, I think this is unfair. I think this is unjust. So that's what we're trying to focus on. That's what clean water forever is about. That's what we're trying to rally communities around, build power, to demand environmental justice, to demand cleaner water, to demand better than 100% of our rivers being too polluted to catch fish and eat those fish. So I will leave it there and I'm happy to take questions. Wow, thank I'm you, gonna, Robert. I'm gonna jump out of my uh, slides. I'm gonna stop. That, that is just fine. Uh, it would be helpful if you could put your contact information in the Q&A because that's uh, the chat's not available to people attending. Um, several things. Um, we have a few questions I'll get to in a moment. But Robert, you added to my lexicon today. Um, oh, good. So here's the phrase that you've added, legacy pollution. Mm. Um, maybe that's not new to some people, but I haven't heard it called that before. Uh, you mentioned it in terms of fossil fuel, but after you said legacy pollution, I was thinking about, oh my gosh, uh, remember when the Cuyahoga River went on fire from steel mill pollution and other kinds of manufacturing pollution? Yes. Um could you just briefly define what you mean by legacy pollution for those of us who are new to this phrase? Yes, good question. And, and, and that's right. It's basically pollution that's still in the environment, in the system today, right? Whether it was, so a lot of, uh, a lot of our work has been, you burn coal and there's all this ash that's left over after you burn it, right? And so that ash has to go somewhere and historically it was just dumped right next to the river. So that's, that's a version of legacy pollution. Your point about river sediment is a great one. Um, and in fact, I saw an interesting story this week where, and let me sing the praises of the Chicago river where it has improved incredibly, right? I don't want to, I don't want to miss that. There is going to be a swimming event in the Chicago river within the next year. It's amazing. And, and wildlife has returned. There are turtles, there are otters. And this is the work of um, advocates who have pushed on this issue for decades. And so I don't want to say that we haven't made progress. We've made great progress. But that progress has been slow and it has been inch by inch and it has been opposed by people <laughs> and in industries who make money on not cleaning the thing up. Anyway, I'm coming to come back to the legacy pollution because I think it's probably okay to swim in the Chicago River now, but I wouldn't touch the bottom <laughs> because all that legacy pollution is down there, right? All of that waste that was dumped in for decades, it's still down there. So swim in the river, okay, maybe. Uh, I'd be a little nervous, but you could probably do it, but I wouldn't want to put my feet in the bottom. So um, it's true on the agricultural side as well, right? 
and this is something that um, uh, there's a lot of discussion about this is that we put on a lot of fertilizer decades ago and a lot of it's still there and so sometimes you will hear uh, boosters of the current agricultural system say well it's not necessarily what we're doing right now there's a lot of stuff that's leaching in from what was done 40 or 50 years ago um, and there is some truth to that but it also doesn't let you off the hook for for what's happening now and we know that there's a lot going in so um, yeah there's legacy pollution basically just meaning you know all these pollutants that were put in years and years and years ago that still have the capacity to impact environmental systems human health wildlife health actually that addresses one of our questions carolyn wants to know um what about the change in the flow of the calumet uh and the De plains rivers how how did that affect what went into Lake Michigan? Did Lake Michigan see some improvement? Was there less pollution into Lake Michigan? Any oh, abs documentation? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's the whole reason it was done is that we could protect Lake Michigan. And so, you know, a lot of these things are done for understandable reasons, right? Like Chicago didn't want to put all of this raw sewage and raw waste into its drinking water source. And it improved the health of people in Chicago. And I, you know, I, sh I don't want to gloss over that. But you also have to look at, you know, everything is, is trade offs, right? And so what what's the cost of doing that? Um, now, the Calumet has long been a kind of, you know, what's called a working river. There's a lot of legacy pollution along the Calumet, because a lot of that, um, you know, a lot of the shipping, a lot of the petroleum products, the pet coke, and you know, just piles of just pet coke uh, along the river. You know, a lot of those communities are are poor, low income, often black and brown communities. And that, that Calumet region has, has long suffered under the burst burden of environmental pollution. So, yeah, running running all that stuff away from Lake Michigan definitely um, kept the lake cleaner. And that's why the lake standard is still higher than the river. And, and you know, I think the other thing that's interesting that plays out is that why, and, and I didn't mention this, but um, there are more invasive species coming from the Great Lakes towards the Mississippi River and perhaps, perhaps more damaging ones. There's dozens coming from the Great Lakes. Why was there all this focus on a couple of fish, as problematic as they might be, all this focus and millions and millions of dollars spent dealing with invasive carp. Well, there's a constituency around the lakes. There's money, there's, there, there's property interests, there's people who care about the lakes. And some of that is a function of having protected those lakes. And you make a decision like that and you say, we're gonna protect Lake Michigan. Well, now it's protected and you build up a constituency around it and people wanna to continue to protect that and people wanna to continue to improve it. And that's great. But the other side of that equation is that you pollute, you degrade, you destroy the stuff downstream. And then you don't have a constituency for something because it's been sacrificed. It's been turned into an open sewer. And so we're only just now trying to build that constituency. We've got it in Chicago now along the river because that's what they've done. They've rebuilt it. The river walk, you know, um, because it's come back. People, people like to go on the cruises. You know all this stuff and so like there's no turning back now in chicago you've built that constituency now we need to carry that down into the calumet region all the way down the river rebuild a constituency rebuild champions for the river that have been that were lost because we allowed it to be degraded at the cost you know for the benefit of the of the of the great lakes and that was the other phrase that you added to my lexicon the sacrifice zones downstream i hadn't heard that framed that way but that's indeed what's happened in many places, and that certainly is exemplified by the dead zone. But sacrifice zones can apply to a lot of other environmental degradation. So I've, I appreciate you adding those. I wanted to mention also, uh, I'm, a, I'm a grassroots uh, farmer, landowner, rancher. I'm a county soil and water district commissioner, elected position in the state of Iowa. One of the things I learned when I joined in that role was that NRCS doesn't refer to farmers. 
NRCS calls the people who are recipients of the government largesse producers. Yeah, I struggled right. with that when I joined, but in some ways it makes more sense because as you mentioned, we've mythologized farmers and what are they today? Who are they today? Where the majority of land in Iowa, farmland is owned by corporations, even if they're family corporations. So uh, I, even though I didn't like the word producers when I became an NRCS commissioner, I, I've, I've grown a little more attached to it because it offers a little more specificity. Uh, a lot of farmland is also leased. Uh, I put the blame on land owners, hmm. not the the farmers, not the producers, not the contractors, not the leases, but to me, the people who own the land. So I wanted to ask you about this. Illinois has a very famous landowner named Howard Buffett. He owns 1,500 acres. He, he, pro, he professes to be a no-till farmer. Uh, you talked about no fall tillage. We call it in Iowa recreational tillage <laughs> in the fall yeah. because farmers have nothing to do. Chris Jones refers to the fact that farmers in Iowa, again, what are you, uh, producers, landowners, uh, only work six months out of the year. They go to Florida the rest of the time. Uh, but I found it interesting that Howard Buffett also owns 1,500 acres of farmland in Arizona and 9,200 acres in Africa. Um, it, it shows again this this differential, differentiation between farmers, producers, and land owners. And I think when we when we have this conversation about what is polluting our rivers and streams, uh, I think we need to be more specific about who those polluters are. And I wanted to also, um, I think we've answered most of the questions. One, Mary Han wanted us to know that it would be better if we all just stopped eating animals because most of the corn and soybean go to animals, uh, aside from the corn that goes to ethanol. And Mary, you're absolutely right about that. But this uh, concept that uh, land ownership has rights that override everybody else's. And that's why I liked your phrase, sacrifice zones, because that really got me to thinking about how can we rephrase the problem in order to find solutions where we can address the people who actually, as you said, have the power to change. And to me, those are the land owners. Um, and that's always been a, a challenge because some of them are shrouded under many corporate umbrellas that you can't get to. Um, and that's a common practice. And it's hard to identify who the real people. I really appreciated your presentation because I thought you really covered the big picture down to some of the finite pieces of why we're here, where we are today. And yet you give us hope in the sense that what your organization is doing um, and I loved uh, your emphasis on trees. Uh, there is a group in Iowa that overlaps Illinois called Trees Forever that uh, absolutely is an advocate for the solution in terms of climate change that trees offer uh, because they are carbon sinks and they are usually planted along low wetland areas uh, or on steep sloping hills going into rivers and streams that can't be farmed. But um, any last thoughts from you? Yes, I Maybe appreciate- a call to action. Yeah, I, I appreciate what you said. If you figure out how to message on it, let me know. It is very difficult and it's, it's so easy to get in the weeds about farmers and producers and, you know, yeah. And it's, it's just very, it's a very difficult thing. Um, and we work with farmers. I know farmers who are doing amazing things and I don't, you know, I don't want to, I don't blame individuals for making rational choices in a screwed up system. <laughs> you know, a lot of these people are, are making choices that are rational for them. And I think that's the thing is like, 
are we just asking people to like, well, I'm going to make a really difficult choice to implement all these pol all these practices on my land that may cost me money, may hurt my yield for a couple of years. Maybe I'll be better in the long run, but I don't know. And and so that's why I think level playing field, right? So, you know, when I think there are things that we could do at the regulatory level, we, we've just we've hamstrung ourselves by taking that off the table. And again, I just point to like, we have a deep investment, not not only, uh, you know, kind of cultural and in, in the health of our food system, but also financial, we put a lot of money, you, you know, the farm bill, right? Like, the public pays a lot of money to this industry. And I think the public should get something for its money. That reminds me that um organizations that I work with in Iowa, uh, we know that Iowa claims to feed the world because we're the biggest producers of corn and eggs and chickens and whatever, pork, I guess. But uh, the issue is that in Iowa, at least, we, Im we import 90% of what we eat. We don't feed ourselves. And the reality is we don't feed the world anymore. Maybe a little takeaway. Robert, thank you so much. This has been uh, very enlightening and very educational. And I guess my takeaway is I'm encouraged to know that you exist out there. Uh, we have colleagues who share uh, a common uh, vision for the future, a common goal, and you've given us some hope about how we can get there. Thank you so much. Again, a reminder to everyone here tonight, this is recorded and will be on our website in a few days. And finally, the reminder is that the Upper Mississippi River Region League of Women Voters will be holding our annual meeting virtually Monday, May 29th from 6 to 7 p.m. And everyone that is a member of a league will send a delegate voting, but you can also attend as a non-voting observer. And we do have a wonderful program at seven o'clock by a gentleman who is now known as the River Lorian. And he's gonna tell us a lot about the beginning efforts to protect the upper Mississippi. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you, Catherine and Lee for helping us admin our Zoom and thank you, Robert Hirschfeld. We really appreciate it. Good night to all. Thank you. Thanks, Robert.